I'm going to talk about development. Um, so I work as an independent education consultant. I've worked in various universities around the world, um, and I've also worked with Cisco. Um, what I'm doing at the moment, I think the most um, interesting project, perhaps, that I'm engaged with is the establishment of a new university, a brand new university in Muscat, in Oman. And this is um, a project led by ISIS Innovation, which is the technology transfer company of Oxford University, which is my alma mater, where I did my undergraduate studies many, many years ago. Um, I want to ask you first, perhaps, how many of you actually work for a university today? Could you just raise your hands? Okay. How many of you believe that in 10 to 15 years, your university won't exist anymore? It will have merged or it will have disappeared? Oh, you're so optimistic, all of you, aren't you? So nobody then, basically, right? Okay, interesting. How many of you have got money in your pocket or in your wallet right now? Pretty well all of you, okay. How many of you went to the bank and spoke with a teller and wrote a checkout saying self and withdrew the money that way from the bank? Nobody. Oh, one. Wow. Richard, I don't believe you. No, no, no. <laughs> Richard Simpson, no way. <laughs> you went to an ATM, of course. You probably booked your air ticket to come here online. I don't think you went to a tr travel agency to do that, right? So there are lots and lots of disruptive changes going on in our world today, driven by technology. Okay, now none of you thought that your universities were going to disappear or merge. So you're probably all right, and Clayton Christensen from Harvard Business School is probably wrong. Because Clayton Christensen says that in 10 to 15 years, 25% of current universities will merge or will disappear. Why? Because of the force of the disruptive innovation represented by technology. And of course, coming from a technology company, Cisco, um, I'm very much aware of the power, the impact that technology can deliver to your organization if it's used appropriately and effectively. And those two words are really, really important. Those two adverbs are incredibly important because so often we see people buying the technology and they're not using it either appropriately or effectively. So basically then a disruptive innovation is one that saves you time and money. Now, as you know, you book your air ticket online because it saves you time, certainly. You haven't got to go down to the travel agency to buy your ticket physically, which we had to do in the old days, of course. And you hope it's going to save you money because you can get a better deal. Okay, now, um, how can, then, a modern university survive in the, in the face of this incredible force of disruptive innovation? And... Um, there's a very interesting booklet entitled An Avalanche is Coming by uh, Barber, Donnelly and Rizvi, published last year. And what they're saying is that the way that a university can tackle the problem of disruptive innovation represented by technology is by becoming local. In other words, yes, you, you are global, you reach out, you're global, you're regional, but critically, you also need to be local. So in other words, you need to deliver value locally to your community. You need to embed yourself with the business community, with the industry, etc., in your locality. All right, now, the irony is that um, I'm engaged right now in a project establishing a new private, not-for-profit university in Muscat, backed by a large group of Oman's leading business families and also by the government of Oman. And the idea is to try to make this university different. We don't just want more of the same. Um, the first university in the Arab world was established in... Anybody know? So, sorry? Morocco, yes. Actually... Well, Morocco might have been number two. There's some dispute about this, but yes. All right, I, I accept Morocco. 
Tunisia also is a candidate. Uh, Al Zaytuna University, 734. They claim they were the first, but never mind. Never mind. Before 1000 AD, there were four universities in the Arab world. One in Tunisia, one in Morocco, one in Egypt, Al-Azhar University, and one in Iraq, Al-Mustansariya University in Iraq. Um, and then, um, I suppose a gap really, a long gap actually, 900 years or so, incredible long gap, when no universities were established. And then uh, by 1953, there were 15 universities in the Arab world. Uh, the first three in the 19th century were in Lebanon. So the American University of Beirut and Université Saint-Joseph. Um, and then, recently of course, particularly in the last few years, there's been a mushrooming of universities across the Arab world. So that today, there are actually more than 600 universities in the Arab world. In 1953, none of those universities, by the way, the 15 that existed then, were in the Gulf. And today, as you know, there are hundreds of universities in those GCC countries. So what we're trying to do is to try to do something different. A university that is genuinely embedded in the local business community and the regional. A university that operates at three levels, um, local, regional, and global. So that's easy to say, I know. The project, by the way, is led by ISIS Innovation, I mentioned to you before. This is not a satellite campus of Oxford University. Oxford doesn't do that kind of thing. But what Oxford does is, through the technology transfer company, is provides expertise and guidance uh, in the establishment of new institutions. So what does an entrepreneurial university then look like? Well, first of all, we need to establish a compelling UVP. I don't want to say a unique selling proposition, but rather a unique value proposition. What is the value that this university is going to deliver? Why is it different from all of these other universities? In Oman, for example, there are in the region of 30 or so um, universities or higher education institutions already. One public, Sultan Qaboos University, and the others are all private. So there's a huge number of private uh, higher education institutions in Oman already. How are we going to be different? Well, what we want to do then is to establish this unique value proposition uh, centered around innovation and entrepreneurship. Of course, we need to recruit and retain high-quality faculty, staff, and students, and we will be looking to do just that. Excellent facilities and infrastructure, of course, it goes without saying. Meaningful international affiliation agreements, I think, are really, really important. So we would like to be able to offer joint degrees, double degrees, dual degrees, call them what you will, so that a graduate of Muscat University gets a degree from Muscat University, but also from the partner institution. Um, and we think that that will help to build the brand rapidly and credibly. But importantly, of course, we can't rely on tuition fees alone. I don't think any university today can. Especially as in Oman, there are some regulations. Somebody spoke today about the stifling regulatory environment. I would not wish to describe the uh, regulatory environment in Oman as being stifling, but nevertheless, in most of the countries in which we work, uh, the regulatory environment is pretty tight. And so there is some control then over the fee level, especially for Omani scholarship students. So we need to then generate third stream revenue from commercial activities, from consultancy, um, from other forms of activity in addition to teaching and to research. We need to embrace technological innovation. And I'm going to come back to this again and again in the course of this presentation because I think it's really important. And uh, we need to start small and lean. Don't try to do too much in the beginning. Build success on success and go from there. The problem we have is that um, costs are being pushed down. Nobody wants to pay high tuition fees. The government regulates these to some extent. But at the same time, everybody wants access. They want to have a large number of Omani students going to that university. So widening access is important. Uh, and also, of course, everybody would agree, quality needs to be enhanced and to regularly and dramatically increase year on year. So that's the kind of problem we have managing these free pressures. And I think that's probably true across the world in all universities today. 
Uh, somebody described this as education's iron triangle. If you change one of those uh, vortexes of the triangle, the vertices of the triangle, then it has an inevitable impact on the other two. So if you uh, widen access, there is, of course, the risk that you're going to lower quality. Okay, so what does an entrepreneurial university look like? Well, a lot of what was said today, I think, resonates here. It's not dependent on the state. That's really, really important. It's got to be independent of the state. It recognizes itself as a business without shame. There's no shame in saying now that education needs to be a business. And your business model needs to be viable and it needs to be sustainable. Uh, Bob Cryan today, the VC of the University of Huddersfield, spoke about only two institutions, one of which is Huddersfield, are actually financially self-sustaining today in the UK. But that is the path that, that Bob and Huddersfield have chosen to go, and that's the path that this university also will choose to tread. Um, we need to seek opportunities for innovation at all times. To take risk, you have to be a risk-taking organization, not too comfortable, not too, not too cozy, and tolerate failure, tolerate mistakes as well, because you learn perhaps more from your failures than you do from your, mistake, uh, from your successes. We need to be customer-driven. We need to respond to customer demands, not trying to just sell our products because that's what we happen to do. So customer responsiveness, very important. We need to empower our faculty and staff, not control them. Give them the highest possible degree of autonomy to operate within the system, the governance system of the university. Entrepreneurship needs to start from the leadership team, from the vice chancellor or president, whatever you call the person at the top. That's the most rapid and dramatic way in which change can be made. From the bottom up is very, very difficult. Um, Interdisciplinarity is very important. That's one of the success factors at Caltech, actually. You know, the one that spends a million dollars on every student. Well, the reason that they are successful in part is that because they're small, but also because they are not siloed. They, are, they, they encourage interdisciplinarity. And that's why they're at the top of the Times Higher Education rankings, number one for the last three years. Um, Reward intrapreneurs. So entrepreneurship is not just about going out and setting up your own business. It's also about changing the way your own organization runs, even if you're working for the public sector, for example. But then intrapreneurs, people who work inside the larger organization, need to be rewarded, either with money, but preferably not just either, but and with some other kind of reward, like promotion, for example, or release time, or whatever it happens to be. And finally, the money invested in this university, or any entrepreneurial university, needs to be patient money. Don't expect a return on investment in year one, in year two, and pr probably not in year three either. So it does require patience. Okay. Um, so what we're looking at now is innovation across the university, entrepreneurial leadership driving innovation from the top, appoint the right person at the top. That is a critical decision, and that's something that we're going to be doing in the next nine months. So if anybody here is looking for a wonderful job, and if you can prove that you are the entrepreneurial leader that we need for Muscat University, please get in touch with me. Okay, um, we need innovative models of teaching and learning. We need innovative research and industry collaboration, and innovative business models as well. So the need for change. Here we are, Model T Ford. Any color you like as long as it's black. How many times are our universities really stuck in the past? Like, we're still uh, thinking along the lines that um, a class is of no value unless you have a teacher face-to-face -face in the classroom. And this thing called online learning or distance learning, this is a very, very poor cousin of face-to-face -face teaching. I don't believe that. I really don't believe that. I had some pretty lousy teachers at school. I had some pretty lousy teachers at Oxford and Cambridge. Not all of them, mind you. Some were brilliant, but some were lousy. They were terrible. I would much rather have taken a really high-level MOOC, a high-quality, massive, open online course with a world-renowned teacher than to sit in some of the classrooms that I've sat in in my time. So we need then to be creative, not just producing more of the same. And I think that's the danger. 
when we talk about establishing new universities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that's a mousetrap. You may wonder why I've got a mousetrap here. Well, if you read um, a very interesting document by Vijay Govindarajan called The Other Side of Innovation. So in other words, you know, why aren't we more innovative? Why, why are we still stuck in the past so very often? And he says that there are three reasons for this. The first one is physical. The institutions and individuals overinvest in old systems or equipment that blocks the pursuit of fresher, more relevant investments. Govindarajan, by the way, is a professor at Tuck School in Dartmouth, New Hampshire. <clears throat> the second block is the psychological one. Leaders fixate on past success, blind to disruptive innovations. They didn't see the tsunami coming because they were looking in the rearview mirror. They were thinking, well, this is what we've been doing for the last 50 years, maybe the last 500 years, and it's been successful. So why would we need to do anything differently? And then the third block is strategic. So focusing purely on today's market without anticipating the future. Uh, in the middle there you see a dinosaur. You don't see dinosaurs anymore. They became extinct. They didn't see the tsunami coming or whatever it was that caused them to become extinct. Here are some brands also that either you don't see today or they have so radically transformed their business models that they're unrecognizable. Uh, Wang Computers, Blockbuster Video, went bankrupt, of course, right? Because, why? Because they didn't foresee, they didn't anticipate the disruptive innovation. They didn't realize that people would not want to go down anymore to Blockbuster Video shops and rent out a videotape or a CD. So Woolworths, Napster, Pan Am, Saab, Kodak. You remember the old camera retailers and the film process on the high street? You don't see them anymore now. They've gone because their business model is no longer viable in the 21st century. Uh, the black cab, I read a very interesting article the other day about how the black cab is under threat now in London. So the first threat was Addison Lee. You know, you can ring up these guys, these private taxis, and they'll come and pick you up. But uh, the only taxis that are allowed to be metered in, in London are the black cabs. However, there's now this organization called Uber, where you can call them up, and you're metered in the cloud. So the taxi itself, the cab, doesn't have a meter, but there's a meter in the cloud. So actually, you are, your journey is being metered through GPS. Isn't that great? So the black cab is now in danger of becoming extinct. Unless, of course, they find a way to change their business model, which they may very well. So I believe that a university today, in order to become global, can accelerate this process through technology. But somehow we are distrustful, we are fearful of technology, we think it's very expensive, we think that face-to-face -face is always better, we think that, you know, it might go wrong or something like that. But we have to take some of the examples around the world. Wharton Business School, University of Pennsylvania, leading business school in the world. They have a campus in Philadelphia and a campus in San Francisco, 3,000 miles apart. And they are now offering their MBA classes, synchronously, in real time, streamed from one campus to the other. So the professor appears on a huge screen, five meters by three meters, in one campus, and in, in, in real life, physical presence in the other campus, and vice versa. And this is a truly interactive, immersive experience for the students. They also benefit, of course, from being exposed to the other students in the other campus at the same time, in real time. Plus, every lecture, every class, every course, every program is recorded, it's archived, and it's tagged. So in other words, when you do your review, or you missed the session because you were pregnant, or you were sick, or you missed your bus, or whatever it is, you can review the lecture, you can, you can go to a particular point in the, lecturer, in, in the lecture where the professor spoke about a particular subject, because you just put in your search term, and it will go straight to that point. So what a powerful review tool this is. Otherwise, as a teacher, I've, I was a teacher for many years myself, and I know that I taught the same course probably hundreds and hundreds of times. I even made the same jokes. 
they get a bit rusty after a while. You just hope that nobody has heard that joke before in your class, right? We'll have a powerful, substantial element of uh, blended learning, of online learning embedded in them. Uh, courses and learning materials, admin materials will be available independent of device, location, and time. So 24-7 access to those learning materials from any place on any device at any time. Um, video intensive, collaboration intensive, and of course, having a paperless library. Somebody spoke today, I can't remember who it was, about the cost of uh, maintaining a library. So there are examples actually around the world now increasingly of paperless libraries. Some people would be shocked by that. A library without books, a library without journals, how could you possibly have that? The technology can answer that today very easily. And if you don't believe it, um, have a look at the university library in Loyola University in Chicago. It's entirely paperless now, completely paperless. And so the library becomes a place not of uh, silent study where the librarian's job is to walk around telling you to shut up, but instead it's a place where the librarian will come and help you and it's a place of talkative teamwork within the library, within the library space. Cost? Well, go figure. How many times do you have to buy replacement books, update your journals, etc., etc.? All of this is available online now. But not just the cost of the materials, the cost of the build of the library is significantly cheaper because you don't have to have the same load-bearing capacity in a paperless library, right? The technical stuff is a lot lighter than the books. Um, also, of course, and this is a point here from the Bibliotheque in Bexar in Texas, which is a, a small city in Texas where they also have a paperless library. The comment here is that geography doesn't matter if your library is in the cloud. The thing that excites me most is that staff can dedicate their time to helping visitors. They're not tied up reshelving, filing, and categorizing. So your library staff don't spend all their day reshelving books and stamping them in and out. They actually are helping the people in the library, helping the students. And that's what a librarian surely wants to do, rather than wheeling around trolleys of books. Okay, I'm almost at the end now. Um, we know, I mean, I could go on a long time about this, but we know that technology can bring in the remote expert. I've been in Libya many, many times um, after the revolution and when I was working with Cisco as well, and we were looking at ways in which the technology could overcome those barriers of distance. So, for example, between Tripoli and Sabha, between Tripoli and Benghazi. Um, unfortunately, because of various factors, we didn't achieve the, the goals that we wanted to achieve. But I believe that the concept is still very valid. Um, in Saudi Arabia, for example, you can reach out to people who otherwise would have very difficult access to education. So, for example, women who cannot come into a classroom where there is a male teacher or where there are male students, uh, they can access um, the courses through the technology that already exists, by the way. Duke University in the States is providing medical training to a very small college in the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. And they're doing that entirely through the, through the technology that's available today. Okay, um, just very quickly now, um, an example of how Muscat University intends to be entrepreneurial. Well, first of all, every student will take a minor in entrepreneurship but not just learning about entrepreneurship, actually doing it. So there'll be a small business incubator at the university where students will get expert guidance on starting a new project, but they will also get seed funding if their project is deemed to be viable. Uh, internship, students will be required to take a placement, a work placement or an internship, either a full academic year or for a summer in Oman or internationally, and every student must have some international experience of at least one semester. Okay, finally, last slide. We talked about leadership. We talked about the need to appoint the right person at the top. And I think this is true of a university. It's true of a small business. It's true of Apple. It's true of Microsoft. It's true of Cisco. It's true of all walks of life. You need the right person at the top. But this is very interesting. This is a quotation from John Gardner, who was Health and Education Secretary under Lyndon Johnson. And I, I'll read it out because I think it's quite interesting. All too often on the long road up, young leaders become servants of what is rather than shapers of what might be. 
in the long process of learning how the system works, they are rewarded for playing within the intricate structure of existing rules. By the time they reach the top, they are very likely to be trained prisoners of the structure. This is not all bad. Every vital system reaffirms itself. But no system can stay vital for long unless some of its leaders remain sufficiently independent to help it change and grow. And that's what we need. Thank you very much. Thank you.